Yes, good morning, Frankfurt. Dear guests, welcome to our 45th Food for Thought event in cooperation with the Association of Foreign Banks in Germany. A big thanks to our partner. Today, Frankfurt is again one hour ahead of London, so let's make the best of it. Actually, Professor Javorczyk is located in London, so um, it's an early day for her. A global pandemic, supply chain disruption, extreme weather, war in Europe, forced migration on a massive scale, rocketing gas prices, high inflation, debt burdens, reshoring, French shoring. It is clear that there will be no going back to the pre-pandemic business as usual. The actual transition report 22-23 of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development examines, examines the tectonic changes that the EBRD regions face and presents a wealth of analysis to inform public policy and business decision-making. The report covers, among others, the economics of war and peace, effects of migration, global supply chain problems, corporate debt and business dynamism, as well as structural reforms. We are therefore very pleased to have Professor Beata Javorczyk as a speaker again, I have to say, who will give us an insight into the EBRD transition report that was released at the end of last year. Beata is the chief economist of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development in London. She is on leave from the University of Oxford, where she is the first woman to hold a statutory professorship in economics. She is also a fellow of All Souls College, Oxford, and the director of the International Trade Program at the Center for Economic Policy Research in London. She is a member and of the Scientific Advisory Committee at IFO Institute, University of Munich, as well as the Executive and Supervisory Committee of Search EI in Prague. Before taking up her position in Oxford, she worked at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., where she focused on research, lending operations, and policy advice. She holds a PhD in economics from Yale and a BA in economics, summa cum laude, from the University of Rochester. Dear audience, please feel free to input your question during or after the speech in the Q&A section in Zoom. Find the button below. So far, Beata, welcome. The stage is yours. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me again. It's a pleasure to be sharing with you our latest uh, transition report. Let me... Oops, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, <clears throat> the transition report is entitled Business Unusual. And I think this title reflects very well what governments, businesses, and the public has been facing um, for the last few years. There is a war waging on the European continent. We have seen the largest forced displacement of people in Europe since the 1940s. Um, supply chains are being upended, and firms and governments are facing record levels of debt, which in the environment of increasing interest rates is going to become a ticking bomb. So in our report, we focus on these four subjects in turn, starting with the economics of war and peace. We look at the experiences of 200 years of war to draw lessons, uh, in particular lessons uh, that would inform the process of reconstruction, reconstruction of uh, Ukraine. So if you look at the last 200 years of wars, um, you see that uh, interstate wars <coughs> were more prevalent than um, civil wars in the 20th century. You see that since the 1990s, uh, wars have become less frequent, but civil wars uh, have become a, a more important as a share of the total number of conflicts. What we see is that financing of wars has changed. And in particular, since World War II, we've seen that foreign financing of wars has become important. More than a third of all wars um, that happened after the 1940s um, have been primarily financed by foreign funding. Now, when you look at domestic 
financing, which is uh, responsible for funding two thirds of wars, here we also see a change. Printing money went out of fashion after World War I. Uh, taxation is difficult um, to do during wartime effort. So domestic borrowing is the way countries typically fund conflict. Now, as I said, what we are particularly interested in is what happens after the war finishes. And here, the message is rather depressing. If you look at the number of countries that recover the, to their pre-war GDP per capita trend, you see that only half of these countries um, have recovered quarter of a century later. The other half of countries see a permanent, or at least you know, if you think about quarter of a century as sort of almost permanent, decline in their living standard. Now, when you focus on wars between states, and in particular wars that have been fought on the territory of the country in question, you see that countries that were engaged in war see a decline in population relative to countries that were similar in population size, in GDP, in GDP per capita, um, that were similar to them prior to the conflict. So in other words, what you see here is comparison of countries that were engaged in war to a control group. And what you see is that war leads to a permanent sh downward shift in the population size, but it's not just a level effect. There's also a growth effect. Um, at least for five years after the war finishes, countries that were engaged in the conflict um, see a much lower population than the control group. The same thing happens uh, to capital stock. There is a decline in the capital stock during the war effort, and then the gap between countries that fought a war on their territory and the control group persists and actually increases over time after the war is over. Now, the wars are also associated with inflation. On average, uh, inflation goes up by 8%, though inflation thankfully subsides after the war effort is over. But what stays around is public debt. Um, so on average, a war between states leads to an increase in the public debt of about 50% of GDP, and this increase persists uh, for many years after the war. Um, to some extent, this may be linked to this foreign financing of wars um, that we have um, seen on an earlier chart. <clears throat> now, what's also uh, rather depressing is the fact that peace remains elusive. After the war is over, um, peace typically does not last for a very long time. Only half of the countries experience peace for a decade or longer, and only a third of countries experience peace uh, for a quarter of a century. Now, in the report, we also focus on, um, we also focus on migration on forced displacement of people as a result of the conflict. And what you see there is that last year saw a very um, sad record. Globally in the world, we have passed 100, 000, 100 million people being forcibly displaced um, through conflict, through uh, persecution. And of course, the wave of Ukrainian refugees has greatly contributed um, to breaking that record. Now, when you think about the public debate in advanced economies, it typically focuses on refugees coming to advanced countries. Um, and many people living in rich countries have the impression that all the internationally displaced people uh, tend to congregate in rich economies. That is actually not true. Um, Middle-income countries and low-income countries 
host the majority of inter of internationally displaced people globally. And if you look at the number of refugees that are hosted relative to the population size, to the native population size, you see that Jordan tops the ranks. Um, the number of displaced people in Jordan is equal to a third of its own population. In Lebanon, that figure is equal to one fifth. In Turkey, it's equal uh, to 5%. And um, last year, some of the EBRD countries of operation, such as the Czech Republic, Estonia, Moldova, and Poland have become host to a very large number of refugees as well. Um, what is different about the last wave of uh, Ukrainian or the, the wave of Ukrainian refugees is that we have much better information about, um, about them. So typically in the previous waves, we only knew when the refugees entered the country. We could count them only at the point of entry. While with the Ukrainian refugees, we actually frequently uh, can trace them, can trace them as they enter, as they go to third countries, and as they leave. So for instance, here you see the figures as of midsummer, um, almost 5 million Ukrainian refugees crossed, crossed the Polish border. Out of that, 1.2 million stayed in Poland. Um, the remainder moved on to other countries, including Germany, um, or returned uh, to Ukraine. Out of that 1.2 million, 600,000 uh, were absorbed by the labor market. And that's quite remarkable because um, these were primarily women and children. But of course, what was different about the wave of Ukrainian refugees is the fact that they were given the right to work um, almost immediately. Now, in this graph, you also see a figure for Russia. Now, it is debatable whether people who uh, were moved to Russia did so of their own volition. Um, so in terms of absolute figures, you see that Germany, as of midsummer, uh, recorded having a very large number of, of, of Ukrainian refugees, followed by Czech Republic, Italy, Turkey, and Spain. Now, what is also remarkable is the changes in attitudes um, towards refugees. Um, so in this chart, we graph um, a response to a question, to a survey question, um, saying people should be able to take refuge um, in other countries, including the country of the respondent, so including your own country, to escape from war or persecution. And the green bars show the number of respondents in each country that say, yes, people should be able to take refuge abroad, including in my own country. And the black diamonds show the answers from 2021. So basically the difference between the black diamond and the green bar is the change in the attitudes towards refugees between 2021 and 2022. And what you see is quite a remarkable um, improvement, or increase in the share of people with positive attitudes pretty much in every country except of Tur for Turkey, and particularly large in Poland, and also a substantial one in Hungary. And as you may remember, Poland and Hungary were not particularly welcoming to refugees during the Syrian crisis. So that is quite remarkable that now Poland is in its attitudes towards, <coughs> excuse me, refugees on, on par with um, the US, more positive feeling than Germany and sort of very close to Sweden. Now the Turkish number um, warrants a pause. One possible reason why um, Turkish attitudes have become less work welcoming to refugees is the macroeconomic challenges the country has been facing. So it's quite possible 
that a more difficult economic situation leads to more negative attitudes um, towards refugees. So actually, it remains to be seen whether these attitudes graphed here will persist um, f f throughout the downturn Europe is now experiencing. Now, um, another survey asked refugees about how they chose the current uh, place where they where they are staying, the place, the country where they found refuge. And not surprisingly, the biggest determinant was the presence of family and friends there. Um, Poland, the, which hosts the largest number of refugees, um, had a wave of Ukrainian migrants prior to the war. So in that sense, it was natural that it received um, a large share of, of the refugee wave. Also, refugees wanted to stay too close to the border with their own country. They were also interested in work opportunities. <laughs> Excuse me. What's quite striking is that benefits and material support did not appear to be such an important factor as actually you might expect. Actually, refugees uh, cared more about work opportunities and, and knowing people uh, in the place where, where they entered. Now, another chapter in the report is focusing on global supply chains in turbulence. And here I'm, I'm going to spend a majority of my time on this chapter, perhaps because this is um, the most relevant chapter to what's happening in the world and to what's to to inform. And it's perhaps the chapter that contains most information uh, about implications of what, what has happened uh, for the future. So I think you know over the last few years we have experienced a lot of. Uh, supply chain disruptions. There was a Fukushima earthquake in Japan. There was the US-China trade war, COVID, uh, blockage of Suez Canal, um, zero COVID policy in China, which continued after until quite recently, as well as the war on Ukraine. And I'm going to argue that this war served as a trigger to finally start the process of reshaping of global value chain. But let me start with a bigger picture. <clears throat> so for our report, we analyzed earning calls between publicly traded companies and analysts. So these are quarterly earning calls when uh, big firms listed on stock exchanges explain to analysts what was responsible for their a particular profit and loss situation. And we did text analysis, in particular, looking for sentences that mentioned supply chains. And we classified these sentences through text analysis as being positive or as being negative about, as sort of talking about supply chains as something that was negative, which you would imagine that in the time of disruption, um, many firms, for many firms, having these long supply chains was a liability. And here we graph the results of our analysis comparing the 2020 and 2022, so the last um, three years, to what was observed prior to the COVID, COVID pandemic, so 2013 to 2019. And in particular, we focus on the net number of positive sentences. So basically we subtract the number of, the sh of positive sentences from the, uh, sorry, we subtract number of negative sentences from the number of positive sentences. Uh, and then we, um, we normalize this by, you know, how fr frequency of, of, of supply chains being mentioned. And what you see is that pretty much in all types of business activities, there is a big deterioration in sentiment. And that's particularly true in manufacturing. While prior to the COVID pandemic, sent, um, firms talked about supply chains as something positive, as something that was allowing them to um, bring profits by the time of 2022, most of the discussion was 
about was about supply chains was in a negative context. Then we looked <clears throat> at frequency of supply chains being mentioned together with the word risk, essentially trying to get a sense of whether firms perceive supply chains as a source of risk. And again, not surprisingly, you see a big increase in frequency of supply chains being mentioned as a source of risk. And if you think about, if you graph various sources of risk that are mentioned by publicly traded firms in those earnings calls, you see that COVID obviously was um, the primary source of risk uh, in 2020. Uh, but by but by the third quarter of 2023, <clears throat> supply chains were very important. That's the, the purple part. Um, but war and access to energy um, were equally of equal importance. And of course, environment, potential environmental risk um, increased in importance in the last few years. Now, our countries of operations, including new EU member states, are very heavily in involved in supply chains. And um, you can see here that they are more involved than advanced economies on the average. And their involvement in supply chains has increased over last decade or so. So emerging Europe, so our countries of operations also were subject to supply chain disruptions. Um, there is this misperception that most of supply chain disruptions were due to China, were due to uh, inability of Chinese firms to produce or, or ship goods. But actually, even though only 20% of firms we surveyed last summer in emerging Europe, uh, so these are exporters and importers, only 20% of these firms have direct suppliers in China, more than half of firms experienced disruptions, primarily due to shipping issues, as well as disruptions caused by suppliers outside of China. Now, the war on Ukraine um, did not have actually a very big direct effect on supply chains because neither Russia nor Belarus Rus nor um, Ukraine were heavily involved in supply chains. Um, actually, only 9% of firms in emerging Europe had suppliers located there. Um, however, the war had some indirect impacts, perhaps through sanctions, um, through changes of trade that I'm going uh, to discuss later. But primarily, what the war did is it brought about a realization that various shocks, whether geopolitical shocks, whether weather shocks, um, whether shocks to trade policies are not going to go away anytime soon. And I think this is this was the trigger that got firms to actually rethink and start reshaping their supply chains. So last summer, we teamed up with the Munich IFO Institute, and um, we inserted into their survey some questions about adjustments uh, to improve resilience of supply chains. And you see the results of that on the right-hand side of, of my slide. You see that two-thirds of German firms um, increased resilience of their supply chains by finding new suppliers. You see that two-thirds of them uh, tried to improve resilience by increasing stocks of inputs. So in other words, they were increasing inventories moving away from just-in-time um, approach to just-in-case approach. And while larger firms were more likely to add new suppliers to their portfolio, the smaller firms were more likely to adjust through changes to inventories. Now, you see the same type of approach undertaken in emerging Europe. You see half of firms adding additional suppliers to their portfolio of additional suppliers and increasing stocks of inputs. 
Um, now, at the beginning of the pandemic, policymakers in Europe were hoping to see reshoring. They were hoping to see production coming back to Europe. That does not seem to be happening. Um, relatively few firms in Germany uh, brought production back in-house. Um, primarily, and in emerging Europe, as you can see on the left-hand side, relatively few firms replaced foreign suppliers with domestic suppliers or dropped suppliers in China. So essentially, what seems to be happening is firms are replacing, uh, so firms are not replacing their suppliers in China, but rather they are adding additional suppliers to their portfolio. Now, the question is, where are these new suppliers coming from? Where will they come from? Because this process of adjustment of global value chains has only, has only just started. Um, half of German firms expressed concrete plans to add additional suppliers over the next 12 months. So because we are interested uh, in this question, where these new supply base will be created, we asked firms about their perception of reliability of suppliers. And here you see that German firms, not surprisingly, perceive German suppliers as the most reliable, followed by other Western European countries, followed by the US, Canada, and Mexico. But then the new EU member states are on the list. Poland, Hungary, Slovak Republic, and Czech Republic are actually perceived as very reliable, as is Bulgaria, Romania, and Croatia. Then um, follows what, Turkey with Western Balkans and North Africa. And what's particularly striking is that suppliers in those parts of the world are perceived as, as significantly more reliable than suppliers in Southeast Asia or in China. And on the left-hand side, you see that the impressions of the emerging European of uh, exporters or importers uh, in emerging Europe are actually the same. They perceive uh, new EU member states and Turkish firms as more reliable than, for instance, Chinese firms. Now, <clears throat> let me now say a few words about what has happened to trade flows uh, in the aftermath of the war? Now, this part is actually not uh, in the report, not in the transition report. It comes from our regional economic prospects, which we um, released um, two, two weeks ago. So if you are interested, you can find more analysis there. <clears throat> so what is happening is we see reshaping of trade flows coming in particular from Europe and within Europe from Germany to Russia. Um, so I'm going to talk because um, this talk is held virtually in Frankfurt, I'm going to focus on German exporters. But if you look, if you replace Germany with the EU exporters, um, the picture would be exactly the same. So the green line on this graph shows <clears throat> that German exports to the world uh, remained pretty much stable throughout 2022. You also see that German exports to Russia dropped by more than half. That's a dramatic drop in German exports. But at the same time, you see that Germany has increased its exports to Caucasus countries and Central Asian countries, and that this increase in the volume of exports is quite large. It's about you know forty percent relative <clears throat> to the baseline. Now, what is happening in those Caucasus and Central Asian countries? Well, these countries. Um, so here, sorry, here I'm just blowing up exports from Germany to these particular countries. You see that Kyrgyz Republic tripled its imports from Germany, Armenia doubled its imports, and Kazakhstan increased its imports from Germany by 50%. Now, at the same time, <clears throat> all, all of these countries have increased their exports to Russia. 
So Kazakhstan tripled its export to Russia. Armenia increased those exports uh, <clears throat> by more than, um, it more than doubled them. Georgia, which is located between Armenia and Russia, is primarily has served as uh, a conduit for re-exports. <clears throat> in, in other words, admitting goods uh, into its territory and then re-exporting them to Russia. Now, Georgia is very diligent in reporting trade and splitting it um, into exports and re-exports. Other countries don't seem to be doing it. That's why you see Georgia, um, Georgia shown twice here. So essentially what seems to be happening is part of trade that was going from Germany directly to Russia now has been replaced by German exports going to Central Asia and Caucasus countries and then being reshipped by those countries to Russia. Now, of course, the volume of that reshipped trade, that intermediated trade is much lower. It is not enough to compensate. It's actually on the order of, of 5%. So it's not fully compensating. It's actually nowhere near to compensate <clears throat> for the trade that disappeared, the direct trade that disappeared between Germany and Russia. And, and this disappearance of trade has created an opening for other countries um, to increase their exports to Russia. And Turkey is one of those countries. While Turkish exports to the world increased by about a fifth, Turkey doubled its exports to Russia. But in the case of Turkey, um, it seems to be their own production, their own production that is being traded to Russia, as we do not see a big increase in EU exports to Turkey. So rather, Turkey saw the opening as Europe is not exporting to Russia, Turkey is seizing the, burning, the business opportunity and coming in. Now, so we've seen reshaping of global value chains. Um, I've argued that we've seen changes in reg regional trade patterns, um, big changes as a result of the war, but there is more turbulence ahead. And in particular, you may recall Janet Yellen talking about French shoring, about the fact that, um, or about the intention that advanced economies should primarily be doing business with countries that share similar values. So in other words, there are a lot of observers who are advocating decoupling between Western democracies and countries such as China and Russia. So in our report, we ask the what if question. What would happen if the world broke into two blocks and we split the world into two blocks based on the UN vote, which took place in March of last year. And that was the resolu UN resolution condemning Russian invasion uh, in Ukraine. And we assumed that the, these two blocks um, would not face an increase in trade costs within members, but trade between the two blocks would become most more costly. On average, um, costs would go up by 20%. And the question we were interested in was, what implications would this have for welfare of countries involved? And what you see is that this would lead to a decline in welfare for pretty much every country. So in other words, you know, perhaps um, this message is not surprising to anybody who follows global trade, but um, the message is very, very straightforward. Decoupling, breaking the block, the world into trading blocks that would limit trade flows between each other would be detrimental to economic growth and would come at a high welfare cost. 
And in the, you know, in our exercise, we were particularly interested in countries of operations. And here you see Morocco and Kazakhstan um, as countries that would lose the most. And that's because these countries have strong links with what would become two trading blocks in our exercise. Now, in the final chapter of the report, we are interested in corporate debt and uh, business dynamics. In particular, the question we ask, is there a real danger of zombie firms being created um, as a result of increasing interest rates and the debt burden that firms are facing. And if you are wondering about what's in the picture, this graphic is meant to uh, depict zombies. <clears throat> but let me sort of start with um, the big picture. So over the last um, 20 years, we saw a very unusual environment, uh, unusual in a sense of very low interest rates. And both governments, as well as firms, took advantage of these low borrowing costs um, and loaded up on debt. So businesses, um, in many cases, are holding um, record levels of debt. Now, with the increase in interest rates, it is quite likely that many businesses will find themselves unable to to serve their debts because they have more debt, because servicing of debt is, has become more expensive, and because um, we are in a time of economic downturn in Europe. And note that until very recently, firms have been sheltered from creditors. Um, they have been sheltered because banks have voluntarily uh, allowed firms to reschedule their payments or because governments have introduced emergency measures that protect firms from creditors. And the big question is, what is going to happen now? Will these measures continue? Or as they are being phased out, are we going to see a new wave of bankruptcies. And what is quite striking is that if you look at Eurostat data that traces number of bankruptcies, and here we normalize these bankruptcies to first quarter of 2016, that's our benchmark. You see the number of bankruptcies roughly stable until COVID, then in Western Europe, so this is advanced EU, the red line, it went down dramatically uh, during the COVID times as governments rolled out very generous support measures um, to their uh, businesses. And then in Western Europe, it remained stable. Um, the data released last week show in uptick in Western Europe, but that uptick seems to be driven by a handful of countries, particularly Spain. Now, the picture in emerging Europe is actually quite different. There is a very minimal uptick. The bankruptcies are down relative to their historical average. They are down by 40%, and there has been only a tiny uptick in the last quarter of in the last quarter of last year. So the big question is, what is going to happen now? With the economic downturn, will many of these firms that have loaded up on that during good times, will they be able to survive? And what makes uh, Eastern Europe different is the um, significant presence of state-owned banks. So, in, for our report, we did analysis of what kind of banks tend to lend to zombie firms. So in other words, what kind of banks keep zombies alive? What kind of banks lend to firms um, that have a very high burden of debt uh, and yet you know, are able to borrow fairly cheaply? And the 
main message that emerged here, uh, lending to zombie firms and to weak firms was driven primarily by state-owned banks. And, and that's because state-owned banks um, often may be directed by their governments um, to support firms, even firms um, that may not be able that would that should not continue functioning because had they been exposed to uh, market level interest rates, these firms would be unable um, to survive. Um, and state banks may be instructed by their governments to do so simply because no government wants to see bankruptcies and layoffs before elections. And also because state-owned banks can count on being bailed out by their government. The other bank type of banks that are enthusiastic lenders to zombie firms and weak firms are banks that are undercapitalized. Uh, that's because um, these banks do not they know that if they stopped lending to zombies, um, they would have to recognize non-performing loans and their low capital base would make the situation very problematic for them. Um, so, um, in other words, I think there is a bit of a ticking bomb in emerging Europe and it would be particularly detrimental if these zombie firms were created um, right now because green transition uh, on which we are embarking requires um, structural changes in the economy. So trapping capital and labor in low performing firms is the last thing that we want to do because that's going to inhibit green transition. So let me close here and let me encourage you to take a look at our page tr-ebrd.com where our transition report is available. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Professor Yevacic, for this uh, very uh, interesting or uh, rather fa fascinating facts um, on the region and also th thank you also for for um, having a special focus on Germany in comparison I think this is uh, this is really uh, striking and I know the report needs no advertising but nevertheless I would like to encourage all our um, participants today um, to have a download, not only because the artwork is excellent, but also because it is it is full of facts that you were not able to mention uh, due to time restrictions. But um, I think this is this is really worth reading and it really addresses all the major issues um, that we are facing today. Um, picking up some of um, the, the questions here, um, the first one is on um, when you talked about financing of war. And I know that there is a discussion about also ethical um, aspects of whether you should invest in Rheinmetall or not. It's, it has a sustainability issue, but um, there is more to this. Um, from your perspective, is, um, is this type of, um, is this really an opportunity for investors? Um, the, the financing instruments is probably um, domestic bonds, but um, what what do you think about? Is this worth, um, yeah, is there, is there, uh, is it worth, worth buying or investing in? Um, so you mean financing of foreign wars, that's? Uh, in from from the countries uh, uh, obviously that are in the war as well as um, from others other sides. Well, so typically, at least based on the data that we have, uh, it seems that financing of war it's done mostly by governments by foreign governments. Um, but of course, if you if foreign governments are financing the war, often they are also supplying arms, and that that you know creates opportunities for their for their industry. So they are enjoying um, some spillovers um, in terms of economic in terms of economics, right? By by supporting um, foreign wars. 
Um, and in that sense, um, a war creates opportunities for investment in uh, armament, in the in the defense industry, mm. in the suppliers to the defense industry. You know, over the last few decades, we were enjoying this enormous peace dividend in Europe as governments were able to um, spend relatively little on defense. And that is, I think that period is over. Governments are increasing their defense spending. So now you're looking from the perspective of investors that creates opportunities for various investment funds um, to invest in defense industry. But obviously there is an ethical question and depending on the focus of a given fund, um, they may or may not be willing um, to do that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, this is it's definitely not an investment in, in line with the sustainability um, guidelines that, that we are facing these days. Um, another question is on the rerouting of, of trade with Russia. So you, you very vividly explained that there is uh, some of the goods are just taking a detour uh, through the um, uh, Central Asian countries. But do you think that, that the sanctions that we are always talking about, are they really working? Or is this just now that there is a, a slight detour and, and otherwise nothing has changed? Um, so thank you for this question. So there is you know, there are several reasons why Western countries and Germany um, has dropped or has you know, de declined its direct trade with Russia. So firms may be unwilling to, see, to be seen as exporting to Russia for reputational reasons. Firms may have trouble processing payments um, with Russia. Uh, firms may they not want to incur the high costs of due diligence of trading with Russia. So they prefer to trade with intermediaries. But of course, some of that trade may be related to sanction busting. And um, we, we did an econometric analysis of trade from uh, Europe, from the EU, going to Russia and going to the center, you know, to these um, countries that I mentioned, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Armenia. And you see that increase in trade has been disproportionate in goods that potentially are subject to sanctions. Now, I say potentially because it's not always possible to map uh, sanctions to product codes one-to-one. Uh, -one. So some of this sanction busting may be happening. But of course, um, the this intermediated trade is very small in volume relative to the trade that stopped going to Russia. However, for some particular goods, uh, particularly sanctioned goods, it, it may be still substantial. So are sanctions working? Um, I think they are working. I think, you know, last year we saw that output in Russian industries went down more significantly in industries that relied on imported inputs. Um, the fact that Russia is deprived of um, imports from Europe, even non-sanctioned imports, means that it's being deprived of knowledge, of technology that's embodied in capital goods. Um, the fact that many Western firms left Russia means that there are no knowledge flows or there are fewer knowledge flows from the West, from headquarters of multinational firms to Russia. So all of this um, is going to translate into lower productivity growth, but it is going to be a cumulative effect that's not visible in statistics yet, but it's going to take its toll on the Russian growth um, within a few years. So that, that means um, that, that sanctions will be more effective over time? Yes. Well, what it means is that the effect of sanctions is um, slow. Mm -hmm. That I think the, my personal view is that this expectation of sanction, that sanctions would lead to an immediate financial and macroeconomic crisis in Russia was unrealistic. 
that it was just simply too optimistic because Russia has been sanction proofing its economy since 2014. It has been prioritizing macroeconomic stability over growth. Um, and sanctions were a shock, but they were able to stabilize the economy. But where sanctions are hurting are through those knowledge flows that Russia is being deprived of. But that has a slow cumulative effect that's going to affect Russia's productivity and growth in the medium term. Oh, thank you. Um, one more question concerning the relocation of global value chains. So just um, just simply, what are the who are the winners and and who are the losers in this? Is this is this as um, as clear as this? <clears throat> I think winners are the countries that will become the location of you know if if firms are following China plus one policy, the plus one countries are the winner winners. Now, um, had there been no war. Um, Emerging Europe, so new EU member states, countries further east, North Africa, would be the obvious winners. Now, what the war did is change the equation in a sense that Europe as a whole is facing much higher prices of energy, natural gas in particular. And even though these prices have come down very significantly, since their peak a few months ago, they are still a multiple of prices in the US. And that means that, you know, emerging Europe or Europe in general is less competitive as a manufacturing base. Uh, and that's what's going um, to make this relocation um, to emerging Europe more difficult. Now, on the other hand, we see CBAM, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, um, which would require carbon payments, <coughs> excuse me, um, and that makes EU member states more attractive as locations simply because they are part of the European emission trading. So the sort of the, the border complications um, would not be there. Um, and, you know, North Africa is another region that stands to benefit. They have very high potential for production of new renewable energy. They produce already um, a lot of it. Um, so I think we are going to see North African countries benefiting, though, of course, you know, there are some challenges when it comes to business environment there that they would need to fix before they reap the benefits. Thank you. Yes, um, looking at, at the clock, unfortunately, uh, time, time is up for today, although we could uh, continue with, with this discussion because there's so many uh, insights within the report. I can, again, encourage everybody to have a look and, and also to follow EBRD because you have a lot of uh, intermediate uh, publications, of course. And um, nevertheless, I would already like to ask for save the date for next year's report, uh, this year's report to be presented. Um, in the end of uh, 2023. So hopefully we we'll meet again in one year's time and uh, have a look whether things have improved by then. So um, thank you again, Professor Jabocic, for your for your wonderful speech. And um, we'd like to continue our Food for Thought event series on March 14th, when uh, Jay Sedadius will uh, talk about financial crime. Um, you know that just recently, probably some of you know that just recently the German government has released uh, or published a website um, that deals with the German application to become the host of the Anti-Money Laundering Authority. This is also worth having a look at. And I think that uh, JC Davies, who comes from Refinitiv, uh, will have, a, have an eye on this one as well. So thank you again, um, Professor Javocic, for, for being with us today. Thank and you for having me. and uh, it was a pleasure. And uh, thanks to all the audience for being with us. And see you hopefully on the on March 14th. Thank you. Have yeah. a good week. Bye bye. bye. bye.